Katarina Gator, the Director of Climate for Change. Many of you will know her work. Um, it's an extraordinary effort that she's um, uh, been un underway for a number of years now. And uh, Katarina will be talking to us about talking climate change with friends, family, neighbours and colleagues. Please make her very, very welcome. Thank you. Um, so for those of you, I know, can you hear me? Is that better? Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our work, I thought I'd just give a little bit of background to that to help contextualise some of the things I'll be talking about. Um, so our mission is to create the social climate in Australia for effective action on climate change. Uh, in a nutshell, that basically means a social climate where the policies we need to actually return a, a safe climate um, are possible, they can be put forward without fear of backlash, and those currently trying to undermine that action um, can no longer get away with it. Um, our work is based on social research that tells us that people, um, that, that um, things like mass media, social media, um, those things are all, all really important for um, keeping an issue on an agenda, raising awareness, um, influencing the sort of national zeitgeist. But the way that most of us actually um, process information, form opinions, decide what to do about that information, decide to act on information, is when we have conversations with people that we trust, or at least where trust is present. And so all of our work is around trying to help people to understand the issue of climate change through conversation, and to help people, like I'm assuming all of you, who do understand that issue, to have better conversations with people around them. Our flagship program is called Climate Conversations. It's not the most imaginative name. We, we tried others, but that was the most um, intuitive for people. Uh, and it's based on the Tupperware party model. Um, in fact, it, it has stolen that model almost completely. Uh, so we train facilitators to run uh, a conversation in people's homes. It takes around two to two and a half hours. Uh, we uh, find hosts usually starting off within our own network, who, who will invite their friends over to an, an evening, usually an evening at their home. Our facilitator goes out and runs the session. At the end of the session, there are a number of things we invite people to do, but one of the key points is that we ask everybody in the room to host the next conversation. And so with that model, we can have, create the depth that is needed for individual change, but the scale that is necessary for social change. So each conversation gets another conversation and another conversation. Not only does that allow us scale, but it also allows us to reach into communities where we might um, where reach deeper into communities and reach people who wouldn't necessarily come to an event like this, um, or even necessarily go to a film about climate change, but they'll come to a friend's house and have a chat. Um, so we're really excited this year. Last month we um, hit 5,000 people who'd come to our conversations in just over two years. Um, we're, this year we're at the point where we're doing a conversation pretty much every single night in someone's living room. And over 50% of the people who come to our conversations are not involved, have, do not receive emails or have any connection with um, another organisation that's working on climate change. So that's really exciting for us. Thank you. <laughs> That's lovely. Um, so it's, it's with our experience doing that that informs this talk, but also some of the social research that um, we have um, looked into that has informed the work in the first place. The first thing, as I was thinking preparing for this talk, I was thinking about some of the um, debate that has gone on, and I'm sure most of you are aware of, within the movement itself around the words climate emergency. Um, and I thought about how that debate has not quite resonated for me, that it seemed to be almost jumping the gun. And recently I was rereading an article by George Lakoff, um, who I, I'm sure some of you know. He's a linguist from the United States. He wrote a book, quite a famous book, about framing called Don't Think of an Elephant. And some years after he wrote that book, he wrote another book, another, sorry, an article um, I didn't write the name of it down, but it's something like why how we frame the environment matters. And it was in response to the way that people had um, responded to his original work, particularly environmentalists, around framing. Um, before I go into what he said, I should just quickly make sure for those of you who aren't familiar with the term framing, 
what it actually means. So it's really the idea that we all see the world through different lenses, through different frames. Um, none of us sees the whole complete picture of the whole world at any one time. It's like we're, we're all looking through sort of a window at the world and um, the different windows that we look through will inform the way that we respond to issues. In fact, that in, you, most of the cognitive research shows that, well, all of it shows that most of us respond to issues um, because of our lens or our frame rather than because of facts or arguments that are presented to us. So the way that we present an issue, the way that we frame it, is really influential in the way that people will respond to it. Um, but one of the things that he said, I've actually written it down um, in that article, is that words themselves are not frames. But under the right conditions, words can be chosen to activate desired frames. He goes on to say, if you make the mistake of thinking that words are frames, you will assume that all you need is the right words or slogans. But in the absence of systems of frames built up over a long period, the words or slogans could probably not do much, though they might be an improvement. And in the case of global warming, all too many people do not have such a system of frames in that conception. In, in the conce conceptual system in their brains. Such frames have to be built up over a period of time and this has not been done. The right language is absolutely necessary for communicating the real crisis. However, most people do not have the overall background system of frames needed to understand the real crisis. Simply providing a few words and slogans can at best help very little. So for me, really, the, the, the sort of more important question is how do we build that frame in the first place so that the words climate emergency mean for people what they mean for us? Um, and in fact, as Lakoff points out, it's not a frame, it's a system of frames. Um, so this morning, I think both Angela and the panel in the morning spoke um, to what a number of those frames might be, and I'm not going to spend today talking about them. Uh, some of them obviously are just around the world already being too hot, um, that climate change is not just an environmental issue, it's, it's, a, it's a person, a human issue, it's a health issue, it's many other things and it's not far away, it's here and now. Um, I actually disagree somewhat about whether or not we should talk about degrees but happy to talk about that in question time. Um, drawdown is another frame that people need to understand the issue, um, the speed and scale of response required, um, also, but also things like how does change happen in society? Um, I think some of the things in, in Common Cause about our commonality and our propensity to come together in times of crisis, as, as Jane talked about. Um, and one of the frames that's actually been, we've discovered is really, really important and one that we end up talking about a lot in our conversations is the frame of us as citizens as opposed to, say, consumers or individuals, which is often how climate and environment has been framed in the past. Um, so there are many, many frames um, and it is really important to understand what they are and have them in mind when you're having conversations with people and to know which frames you are trying to speak to or activate for people. But today what I really want to talk about is well, how, once you have those frames and you know what they are and you know what you want to convey to people, how do you do that in a way that is effective? Um, the really short answer is that the most effective way of helping people to see a different frame is through storytelling. Um, so, I mean, I think a really powerful example of that actually was that um, SBS documentary, um, Go Back to Where You Came From. I think we, we really saw people all of a sudden, that were, you know, walking in someone else's shoes is really helping people to understand a different frame. So one of the really important things that we can all do um, is start to think about our own stories. Um, often if you go to trainings with activist organisations, you might learn to deliver your own personal narrative and we all have lots and lots of narratives. I really recommend that as a, a, a first step to start thinking about how was it that you understood um, the urgency of the issue or the scale of the response or that the action we need to take is as citizens. All of those things have a story around them for you and just by telling your own story to people it helps. It, it shifts people away from being sort of beaten down with facts and arguments and actually starting to respond 
um, and open up to you. And it's really important when telling those stories to not just talk, again, to facts or events and then and then and then, but actually speak to um, the values behind your decisions and behind you seeing things in a certain way. And the way that we do that is actually by speaking to emotions. So we understand our values we experience through the way that we feel about things. We know we value something because we feel love or tenderness or passion. Um, and so being able to speak to those emotions can evoke those values for people. Um, but before you even get to um, storytelling, people have to be receptive to what you want to say. Um, and one of the things we know um, is that most people will uh, listen to you and um, be receptive to you when they feel that they have been listened to first. Um, so I think if there is, actually there are two really key takeaway messages from today and one of them is just to learn to listen first. Um, the other one is to let go of an outcome of a conversation, which sounds really counterintuitive. Um, but I think um, if we, as I think as Angela was saying, um, mo most of us actually have fairly common things that we care about, things that we value. And most of the truths behind climate change are fairly self-evident. And as the polling shows, most of us are actually already concerned and already know a lot of what we need to know deep down. We haven't necessarily connected the dots and worked out what they mean for us, or at least others perhaps not in this room had not done that. Um, and the way that people do that is for themselves. Um, so by letting go of what you want people to arrive at and just letting them arrive at it themselves is actually the most powerful way to have a persuasive conversation. Um, and then once, you know, if, if they're not arriving there because they haven't got that frame, then coming in with the story that um, conveys that frame. So um, the, the, the key tips that I would give for the conversations uh, first of all, let go of an outcome. Trust that the truth and our common values will actually lead most people to where we want them to be. Ask curious questions um, to, to let people, to prompt people to think that way. Um, I think one example, and, and another thing that I've found useful is when I have... Um, had, sometimes when you're, you're listening to someone and someone says something that you really disagree with and you just want to come in and argue back or tell them what you know or what you think, um, thinking about how can I turn what I want to say into a question rather than an argument. So a really powerful example of that for me was early on in our work when we were doing focus groups and being a really small organisation, we didn't have any money to pay anyone to do the focus groups for us so we had to go out and do them ourselves. Um, and I was in a group of people, uh, they were um, sort of second generation migrants, mainly business people, quite um, sort of, you know, they had lots of nice cars and, and quite sort of, um, I guess, um, business focused and, and fairly materially focused. And we were having a really good conversation and then someone started talking um, about taxes. I think we'd been talking about the carbon tax and they all of a sudden started talking about how we all pay too much tax and how terrible it is. And my stomach sort of did a bit of a, a skip as I wanted to sort of say, no, but taxes are important. We need taxes if we're going to do all the things we need to do in society. But of course I couldn't say that because it was my job to run the focus group and you, you don't give opinions when you're running focus groups. Um, so instead I just said to them, wow, that's, that's really interesting um, because um, earlier on in the conversation you'd all talked about how important public education was and how um, our hospitals aren't funded well enough um, and how you think we should have a better healthcare and education. And um, I've always understood that the way that we pay for those things is through taxes, so I'm really curious to understand how you, um, you want those things but you also don't want to pay higher taxes, how do you, what's your solution for that? Um, and all of a sudden that question opened up a completely different conversation around the fact that people actually, it's not that they minded paying taxes, they just didn't trust our current government to spend those taxes in the way that they wanted them to be spent. 
Um, and then that opened a, a conversation into, well, democracy and how do we hold politicians to account and what's our role as citizens? And that was a whole new conversation which was far more productive than if I had come back and just argued my point. Um, so thinking about um, every time you do want to step in and make a point, take a deep breath <laughs> and just ask a question. Try and think about how you can put that point in a question that helps other people think about perhaps the, the things that aren't quite making sense about the things that they're saying. And then at the very end, when you've listened and you've asked questions and people are sort of, you know, thinking things through, and you do actually feel that you do need to bring in perhaps um, a fact. Um, I think a lot of people will tell us that facts aren't important. It's not that facts aren't important, it's just the way that we present them. Um, and the, the most effective way to do that is to, to tell a story or to use a metaphor. So having, you know, really going away and thinking about what are those stories. They don't have to be exciting. A lot of times people, when we do our personal narrative training, they say, oh, but I just read a book <laughs> or I just saw a documentary. That's absolutely fine. Um, talk about that. Don't go into too much detail about what it said, but talk about how you felt when you realised, what, what did you realise from reading that book or seeing that film? What was the thing that came home to you? How did it make you feel when you realised that? And then what did you do about it? And how did what you do make you feel? That's really the formula for how we respond to people as human beings, by understanding um, what we did in response to things and how it made us feel. Um, so those are really the key points I wanted to share with you. I was so worried that I had so much to say that I wanted to keep it really short and allow lots of times for questions. So there's lots of other things I can definitely bring in here, but I thought it might be good actually to start to have some, I guess I like conversations rather than lectures. Um, so if you do want to um, ask questions, then I'm happy to respond to those. Yeah. So um, I don't know if anyone heard that, I might repeat it. Yep. Um, so Bronwyn asked, how do you balance that um, so I guess listening and understanding where people are at with talking and, and telling people things. Is that how your question? Yes? Um, I would say um, err on the side. And look, this is as much an a example of do as I say, not necessarily as I do, because I think this is actually something very hard and I'm, I'm not always fantastic at it, it. But when I have managed to do it, I have seen how much more powerful it is. And perhaps I'll, I'll give another example of that in a, a second. But I would definitely err uh, more on the side of listening and asking questions um, than I would on, on the side of, of telling. If, if you're at all unsure, just go further. And even if it's, I mean, so another a skill that some of you might be familiar with um, is active or reflective listening. So. The idea behind that is it's not just sort of listening and nodding, <laughs> but actually really, in, you know, really being conscious of your listening. Show the person that you're listening to. Really, you know, move into them. You know, give them your full attention and listen to the words that they say, and also look at the um, their physicality, their body language, um, and try and observe what they're actually telling you. So if you're stuck for something to ask. Even just sort of saying things like, you know, I can see that makes you really sad. I can see you're really passionate about that. I can hear the anger in your voice when you talk about that. Just prompting with something like that can often bring them further. Just repeating back what they've said to you um, is another way to prompt them to go further. Or even just sort of saying, I, tell me more about that. I, I'm not quite sure what you're saying there. I, I'd, I'd like to understand that further. Going there... Um, even if you're not sure um, if you, you need to do that, I think is always more valuable than jumping in too quickly. Um, and I think an example for that, again, is, is that same focus group I was talking about um, actually had a denier in the group as well. And, I mean, he wasn't meant to be there because we had... Um, it, the group was for people who were sort of sympathetic to our message but not necessarily engaged, but he'd, he'd somehow got into the group... Um, and he was not just a denier, he was 
like when we'd given him a survey beforehand, he'd said climate change was an Agenda 21 conspiracy and he talks about it all the time to his friends. Like he was one of those deniers who really, really aggressively um, against anything on climate change. And again, my role was just to ask questions and listen. I couldn't offer an opinion. I couldn't. Um, and I was so anxious the whole time because it wasn't, you know, it was okay that he might think that, but there were nine other people in the group who were all potentially going to be influenced by everything he said and I just had to sit there and hold it in and ask questions and be attentive and allow him time to speak. Um, but through doing that again, we actually got to the point where he also told me that even though he didn't um, believe in climate change, he thought that coal was disgusting um, <laughs> and dirty and we should not be digging that stuff up and burning it and he was completely off grid um, himself and um, and then we um, at the end of the conversation and we went round and asked people sort of how, how they felt about it and what they got out of it he said you know I usually feel like a nutcase, nobody ever listens to me and I felt really valued today and thank you, it was one of the, the best experiences I've ever had. And I went round and asked everyone else and no one actually, they still didn't, even though they'd sort of said, oh, that's really interesting when he'd said things, none of them, they'd all decided that he wasn't right. They all still were worried about climate change and, and, and asked me for some of the information and I, I couldn't really give them that but I did sort of say, well, you know, you all said that um, one of the problems is that our government isn't doing enough and actually, oh, they asked what they could do and, I, and whether they could eat me less meat or transport or anything. Um, and I said, well, I think one of the most important things we can do is actually, you know, take back our democracy from those vested interests that you all talked about and we need to sort of, you know, it's through conversations like this that we come together and we decide that and we'll, we'll go door knocking and we'll go you know, house to house, that's how social movements happened in the past and that's what we've got to do again and we've got to take our democracy back. And everybody was really excited about that, but he was the most excited and he, by the end of the session, he'd come and hugged me and asked me to come on his radio station to talk about how we hadn't always agreed on the problem, but we all agreed on the solution together. And I think I just never would have had that productive conversation with him um, if I hadn't been forced to go beyond where I normally would to listen. So I think... You know, if, if at all unsure, just listen further. It's amazing what comes out. Yes, Bronwyn, and then... Your, so your question was around what we're doing, initiating conversations in, in around groups. So that the conversations I was telling you about earlier were focus group conversations, That so they're not the work that we currently do. However, our experience through that also showed the value of that type of conversation as well. Where, so our current conversations are a bit more directed. We do give people information as well as have, it's, it's a bit of both. We start with a little video, we talk about people's reactions to the video, we ask people what they can do, we have a few processes where we guide people. Um, yeah, through understanding the, the, the powers that are involved in, in, in why we are where we are. And ultimately our goal is to try and help people, to try and activate people as citizens um, because most people who come to our conversations will talk about things like keep cups and recycling and, and doing that sort of individual action. And so our conversation takes people through understanding their role as citizens in a society as well. So it's quite complicated. <laughs> Thank you. And I can see where the climate emergency message might not be the right message in, in many of those instances. Well, yeah, I mean, so I think going back to that, I think our message is a climate emergency message in that it, it, we're building up many of the frames that are in within that climate emergency. But whether or not we use the word climate emergency, by the end of it, um, what, so I guess one of the things I, I talked about in earlier on is that we actually do take people through, well, so you've, you might have heard of this two degrees business, what does that even mean? Why is it important? Um, we take people through the fact that it's actually too hot, we're already too hot, um, you know, what, what it would mean to actually avoid two degrees in return um, to safer temperatures. And we get people to repeat that back to us. So by using that framework, um, I think we actually help people, it, we're, we're building that climate emergency frame and I think then afterwards if you, to use those, that language would work for people at the end of the conversation where it wouldn't necessarily have worked at the beginning. Um, two things. First of all, compared to um, Al Gore's shock and awe, this is much more humble. And, 
<laughs> just a reflection on, you know, helping people feel that they can do something as individuals, as ordinary, regular people. And the other thing is I've heard you talk about moving into the early majority and where do you think climate for change is in that situation now? Yeah, great. Thank you. Good questions. A lot of people, when they sort of hear that big message of the sort of big solutions, um, and, and I think one of the things we often do hear from people is that it's all up to the big important people and what can I possibly do. Because we only think in that frame of individuals and consumers, we don't think in the frame of citizens. So, um, again, I think really activating the idea that we are citizens in a democracy and we ultimately, I don't know how... Um, how else to phrase it, I'm looking for another term, but we ultimately hold the trump card um, when it comes, sorry, <laughs> it's really ruined at the moment, but you know, we all, you know, we're ultimately the ones who have that power over, over those vested interests through our engagement in our democracy. So I think that's, that's the conversation we have with people a lot. I, when we went into this work, I thought it would be more around the problem of climate change, and actually I'd say probably more than half our conversation is actually more around our role as citizens in a democracy. Um, and, and I guess that's what I was trying to speak to when I said climate emergency is a system of frames and one of those frames is citizenship, um, which we often don't talk about. Um, and then in terms of reaching the, you know, what, who's the audience we're reaching, um, for those of you who perhaps don't understand that question, um, social, uh, social diffusion theory um, talks about... Um, all change happening, uh, starting with a small group of people called innovators, um, moving from innovators to the early adopters. When the early adopters take on um, an idea, that's when we reach a tipping point in society. Um, they're the ones who, uh, most people will not take on something from an innovator. Innovators are a bit fringe, radical, whereas early adopters are more trendsetters. We're more likely to, to follow them than the innovators, so they play a really critical role in making change happen. Then we get the early majority, and the early majority is the critical mass that we need for change to happen, and so ultimately we need that, that, that early majority on board with the climate emergency um, to, to have the emergency response that we need. Um, and then you have late majority and, and they jump on board pretty quickly once the early majority's on board and the laggards come kicking and screaming but that doesn't really matter so much. And so our work is always around trying to reach um, the early adopters and the early majority. They're the two audiences that we try and reach. Um, we're, we're actually doing a bit of research at the moment trying to understand better who our audience has been. So. Um, I think some of the questions we've asked in our survey when we do the conversations hasn't, haven't quite honed in on that. So we're currently um, sent out a survey yesterday to people who came along to try and understand a bit better where they sit. But most of our conversations, just from the reflections from our facilitators, seem to have a mix of early adopters and early majority. Um, the early adopters would be people who would then go on to host or even facilitate. Um, and then the early majority of the people, I guess, we're ultimately trying to shift. Because if you look at any polling on climate change, I'm sure you'll all know, the vast majority of people say climate change is real, it's serious, it's urgent, we should be doing more. I believe there's more research out today that says all of this and the numbers have gone up. And yet, we don't still have... When, when push comes to shove and actual policies are put forward, it's only about 40% of the population that really strongly supports them. So if you look at the carbon tax... I think when it was first put forward, about 60 to 65% of the population supported it. But by the time Tony Abbott had done his fear-mongering, only 40% supported it. When you look at um, news poll asked whether we should um, uh, abandon our Paris commitments if it would increase energy prices, 40% of people said no, which is great. 45% of people said yes and there were 15% of people in the middle who said they didn't know. And it's that 15 to 20% of people that say we want stronger, at climate act, stronger action on climate change, even at significant cost. But then when actual concrete proposals are put forward, they waver. They're the ones we ultimately need to actually have a deep, unwavering commitment before we will get those policies. So we're always trying to reach those two people. We need enough of the early adopters so that we can get more hosts and more facilitators to go deeper into networks, but we're also trying to reach 
the early majority. Um, Katarina, thank you. Um, Jean Blackley from Project Drawdown Australia. Um, we've talk, you've talked about um, the importance of frames <coughs> and the notion that, that words aren't frames, that words evoke frames, and the need for them to be present, that if you want to evoke a frame with an audience uh, in a conversation or, or another format, that that frame needs to be there. So you've shared with us that one of those frames is uh, the frame of citizenship and engaging your, the, in your conversations at Climate for Change, it's been about shifting people from the mindset of an con individual consumer to your role as a citizen. Would you mind elaborating on the other frames that you think <laughs> need to be present or even, you know, just Sure, I think there are lots. Key ones? Yeah, I, I mean, are. I think that's one of the points that Lakoff makes in his article is that it's, it's a really complex, I mean, as we all know, climate change is a wicked problem. It's, and I mean, I think that was presented in a number of the, um, the talks this morning as well. Um, and I mean, one of the points that Lakoff makes is that it actually takes, unfortunately, it takes years really to build these frames usually in, in society and somehow we have to try and fast track that as quickly as possible. Um, but, you know, just, I, I guess the, the frames that we sort of are trying to bring into the conversations, first of all, are around the um, urgency and the scale and the horrific nature of the of the problem we face so as everyone I think has said today just really being real about what that means and for us we do actually use the the framework of of degrees to try and help people put some um, structure around well you know what is it that we we actually have to avoid how you know and and I guess ultimately the frame there is really the drawdown frame though that we ultimately have to not just get to zero as quickly as possible, but actually be finding ways to draw carbon out of our atmosphere and return back down. So that, that's a frame I think is really important. And, um, and the frame of climate as an issue that affects everything, not just polar bears and all of those things, which I think a lot of people have been talking about already and there's a lot of work already done on that. So that, I guess that's the frame of the problem. Um, then there's the frame of the solutions and, and sort of the, the scale of those solutions and, and what they look like. And I guess the, the drawdown work's really important to that. Um, then there's also the frames on um, how social change happens and how, and, and even just how human beings have, I guess that, that perhaps what um, the climate, the emergency, um, you know, talks about the warlike. Um, response, that sort of idea that we all can, you know, that in the past, giving examples of how in the past we, we have come together and how human beings do rise to that challenge and we can come together. That's another frame. Um, the frame of, of us actually being generally good, compassionate people is really, really important. So I think, I'm, I, um, you know, Common Cause has done some work around um, the fact that most people actually have compassionate values but they think everybody else doesn't and that's actually really, that's one of the people who have the biggest perception gap are the ones who are least likely to be active. So actually the frame around us actually all being people who do care is really, really important. Um, and yeah, then, then the frame around sort of action as citizen action um, more than, not, not to dismiss individual or consumer action, but really reactivating that citizen frame, which I think has, has really been lost. So, I mean, I'm sure I've missed some frames there, <laughs> but those are ones that come to mind. I was just wondering if you're collecting data on what people are doing differently after they've participated in these conversations. Yes, thank you. Wow. <laughs> um, so, again... You know, we're, we're a really tiny organisation. Um, for those of you who don't know, we've just we've started, we've been doing this work just over two years and um, until now we've basically crowdfunded all our work. So um, if you've ever tried to do proper evaluation, you'll know it's quite expensive. So that's been one of the, the difficulties for us. But we have, as I said, we've just engaged a group of volunteers who are going back to our um, p attendees, the 5,000 or more people who come to our conversations to find out a bit more about who they were but also about the impact of the conversations on them. 
I think what we will find from that research is that the immediate motivation, and we know already that most people are much more motivated and much, what's really interesting is when we ask, we do do a survey immediately afterwards and ask people what they're going to do and whereas at the beginning of the conversation they've talked about sort of individual and consumer action, almost everybody talks about writing letters to their members of parliament and talking to other people and getting involved in, in campaigns. So I think that's... Um, that's really exciting, but I suspect that what we will find is that a lot of people didn't carry on and go and do that work simply because we as an organisation have not had the capacity to support that. Um, I, you know, I, we know from my, my background was in behaviour change, and as you know, we know that it's not just about you know motivating people. You also then have to break down barriers and maintain that motivation and give them things that they can do, which we haven't as an organisation had a capacity to do, but. Um, you know, what we, our, our sort of strategic plan for the next few years is to try and partner with, now that we've worked out that side of things and the, the motivation and engagement, we feel we've got a really strong model that we know also has the potential for growth and all of those things. I feel we've, we've basically tested a concept and piloted a model of engagement when we've proven that to be really effective. The next step is to combine that with work of other organisations so that there's a, a ladder of engagement beyond those conversations to, to actually get people moving into firstly just basic citizen action and then ultimately activism.